The Mogcast, a fortnightly conversation with Jacob Rees-Mogg about the topics of the day. Jacob, welcome to episode two of The Mogcast. And to introduce myself to listeners, I'm Paul Goodman, editor of Conservative Home, and we will now be in conversation for this second Mogcast. Unsurprisingly, we're going to talk about Brexit. So let's start in this way. Um, The government's position is that it will discuss a transition with our EU interlocutors. It will then discuss a trade deal. It hopes and indeed expects this deal to be in place by the autumn. Uh, Then to have it agreed and signed off by the time we leave the EU formally. We will then enter into an implementation period, not a transition, an implementation of the deal. Um, And uh, on we go towards the end of this implementation period of about two years. Now, I'm not going to ask you if that's possible. I'm going to ask you if, as you see it now, that timetable is likely. Um, It's not impossible. Uh, It's... um I think with all these discussions, everything's decided at the last minute, and it's all about political will, it's not about legal technicalities. The question you always have is, do the parties want to do it? If they do, they will get it done, and they will get it done in time, and if they don't, they will use time as an excuse for not being able to do it. I asked you if it was likely. I think what you've replied in essence is that it is possible and could happen. I think there are many difficulties. One of the biggest is that the government hasn't yet worked out what it wants at the end of this transition period. And it is now a transition. uh, I think this is unfortunate. I supported the idea of an implementation, but David Davis's speech made it clear that it is a transition. And the difference is that if it's an implementation, you have left on the 29th of March and you are implementing the consequences. So you may be changing the queuing system at Heathrow for people coming in, and that may take few months to get the builders in. If it's a transition, you are still de facto in the European Union, you're taking European law, you're bound by the European Court of Justice, you've got freedom of people, and you're still paying money in. As that all seems to be conceded by the government, it is now definitely a transition, but a transition to an unknown and unthought through destination. And that's very worrying. Now, you've come exactly to the point where I wanted to go, um, which is, if the government is now using the language of transition, it suggests that it no longer expects it's going to get this free free trade deal all wrapped up by March 2019. There won't be an implementation because there'll be nothing to implement. There will be a transition. Now, uh, let's go on to talk about this. I'm very familiar, as many of the listeners will be, with your view that while we're in this transition, we will be a vassal state. I have to say, uh, it's not a view I've found shared by all members of the Brexiteering Kirk, but there is another I want to put to you, which is that once we get into transition, it's going to be very difficult to get out again. Because once you're in it, and we do not know how long we're going to be in it for, is the government really going to pull the plug on it? When the usual suspects, as Brexiteers will say, say, we can't have another cliff edge. And if the transition is two years, that takes you to what? The spring of 2021. At that point, the government might seek to prolong this transition beyond the date of the next election. Isn't that a real and present danger? I think you hit the nail on the head that unless everything is agreed by March the 29th, there is nothing to implement. It is there a transition without an end point in sight. As somebody said to me, it is a plank, not a bridge. And you still risk, if you're walking along a plank, falling off the end of it if you bring the transition to to a conclusion. And it also, crucially, takes away all our negotiating power. Because once we're in a transition, we're bound by the European Court, we're bound by new laws, we're bound by free movement, we're still paying money in, What incentive is there for the European Union to come to any deal at all? And this is the crucial thing. Our negotiating power dissipates with every pound that we pay into the European Union budget. If we stopped paying in and gave no more money after 29th of March 2019, 
the final 21 months of the multi-annual financial framework are insolvent. The EU has no ability to borrow money, it would be illegal, and none of the countries that pay in want to pay more, and none of the countries that receive want to receive less. That is such a strong negotiating card, and if in a transition we carry on paying, that card has been thrown away. So it is essential that we know where we are going by the beginning of the transition period, but how can the EU agree a conclusion with us when we don't yet know what we want to ask for? We'll come to that in a moment. How long should a transition period, if there has to be one at all, be? Well, I, I think um, Michael Barnier has got it right that it should coincide with the end of the multi-annual financial framework. That makes sense. There is a logic in us paying in for the period that we had agreed to in the unanimous consent to the budget agreed in 2013 for 2014 to um, 2020, the very end of 2020. Um, it gives us slightly longer before the next election. And if we know where we're going at the end of it, there are many things that Eurosceptics such as me could accept in a genuine implementation with a clear end point that are very troubling if we don't know the end point. Do you believe claims that uh, the government, or perhaps civil servants without maybe minister's knowledge, but that would seem hard to believe, have given secret assurances that the transition period will be longer than two years? I think it's improper to blame civil servants. I know there's the convention of the King's evil advisers, and that has great antiquity. But in our political system, as Margaret Thatcher so beautifully put it, advisers advise and ministers decide. Uh, the UK civil service operates on the basis of doing the will of the elected government. If there are civil servants who are going behind the government's back, and there's evidence of that, they should be fired. There's no question, there's n beyond the uh, remit that they've got. So I think politicians have to take responsibility. And I see that this is denied by the government, saying it does not want it extended, it hasn't asked for it to be extended. And I trust governments to tell the truth, not least because the consequences of governments not telling the truth are very serious. Just to leave those consequences hanging in the air for a moment, and just one final question on the transition. Would you actually prefer it not to have a transition at all and just put the date for exiting the EU back. So we're in for a longer period. We have control in the sense that we have MEPs in the European Parliament, we're sitting on the Council of Ministers, and we're in it, and then just go at a later date, rather than have this dangerous, arguably, period of transition. I posed this as a question to David Davis at the um, Brexit Select Committee, but I posed it as a question, not a, advocating a policy. I don't think the British voters would tolerate an extension of our membership. And it's why I think it's important that the government gets the negotiation of the transition right and slightly stiffens its backbone. Um, David Davis's speech last week was not the most exciting speech he's ever given. Which takes us where we've been twice before and where I think you want to get to, which is this question that's hanging in the air today. Irrespective of the transition and all that, what on earth is the government's plan? The cabinet committee that is due to discuss uh, the future shape of our relationship with the EU, we read, has had the discussion put off. The PM was to make a speech outlining the way ahead. That, we read, uh, has been postponed. So there appears to be a vacuum. And that vacuum is being filled with noise about leadership challenges, letters to Graham Brady, goodness knows what. What should the Prime Minister do now? Um, the odd thing is that the policy is very clear. It was set out in the Lancaster House speech. It was reiterated in the Conservative Party manifesto. It was marginally adjusted at Florence, but not in a way that was impossible for people like me. And yet we're in this situation where, in spite of all of that, government policy seemed to be adrift. And what I've been trying to do is to back the government's own policy which, if it were following, gives a very clear lead as to where we're going, uh, a, a direction, and is satisfactory, I think, both to leavers and to remainers. Um, so what would I advise Mrs May to do? 
Um, I would say stick to what she said in the first place, because she's got a lot of support for doing that, not just in the Tory party, but in the country. Right. What she didn't fill out in the first place, even at Florence, was precisely what our relationship would be with the EU in terms of regulation. What will we follow automatically? What will we break completely free from? What will we negotiate? What will be the mechanism? That, that's not completely clear. And that's where the impasse currently is. And it takes you to this choice of, um, oh, are we going to be, in very crude terms, more like Canada and have a more distant relationship, or are we going to be more like Norway, which was where the Chancellor was clearly going last week. There's a vacuum here, and people with different views are fighting for control of what's to shape it, are they not? Um, I think that uh, Lancaster House was reasonably clear that we are out of the single market, out of the customs union, and that we would have the ability to make deals with other countries. We will have no ability to make other countries if we have a high degree of regulatory alignment and we remain within the customs union. We may have technical ability to, but there would be no point. They would get no benefit from it. And why should they waste the time of their negotiators and bureaucrats in getting a deal uh, if it's not worth anything? So I think Lancaster House was surprisingly clear about that, surprisingly forthright, and that people are trying to refight these battles and the Chancellor seems to me to be uh, to have become a semi-detached member of the Cabinet, opposing policy from within it and not following the norms of collective responsibility. If you have a semi-detached member of the Cabinet, surely you have to detach that member, do you not? Well, I, I like the constitutional proprieties, and therefore I don't think it's for me as a backbencher to say who the Prime Minister should have in Her Majesty's Government. No, but you're taking the conversation as far to the edge as you can by saying he's become semi-detached, are you not? Look, I think he is ignoring the constitutional norms by not following collective responsibility and making up his own policy. But I'm going to observe the constitutional norms uh, and leave them as a matter of the Prime Minister. It would also follow that others should draw the necessary conclusion if senior ministers of the Crown are flouting constitutional norms. It, it is very difficult for government when the First and Second Lord of the Treasury disagree. We've seen this before, when the Chancellor and the Prime Minister are not working together as one, as with Gordon Brown and Tony Blair, as with Margaret Thatcher and Nigel Lawson at the end of uh, her period of office. At that point, it is bad for the government. And this is a real problem, and it's caused by the Chancellor. It's being put about uh, by um, people who don't like the Brexiteers very much, um, by the Remain lobby, by the lobby within the party that wants to stay in the single market and the customs union, that the Prime Minister is in deadly peril because the Brexiteers are turning against her, turning the temperature up, telling her what she can and can't do, and it's for that reason that she's in peril of these 48 letters. What's your reaction to that? I don't think that's right. Um, I don't think she's in any peril from people like me. We are the ones who are supporting her. We are her Praetorian guards. Who is she in peril from? Well, there are always people in any parliament who are unhappy with the leadership. Um, and that is a constant of political life. There are people who are out of sympathy on political grounds. There are people who are out of sympathy on personal grounds. Uh, but the threshold is quite a high one and it hasn't been reached. And my personal position and what I'm encouraging my friends to think is that we should support uh, the Prime Minister because her official policy on Brexit is the policy that we want. And I'm just putting it to you, not because I hold it, but because it's just being widely said, as follows. The ERG um, was being chaired by people who in fact had one foot in government, whether for good or, or for bad. Now, Jacob Rees-Mogg has arrived and he's very determined, very eloquent and prepared, if necessary, to be confrontational. So he said that um, Conservative backbenchers are prepared to vote against the government in relation to the coming customs bill. And here's Jacob turning up the temperature. Well, look, I'm very unconfrontational unconf by nature. I'm, I'm very easygoing generally. Uh, but I think that the job of backbench MPs is to hold the government to account. I don't think that Parliament is there as a rubber stamp. And I think we as Conservative MPs have a duty to our manifesto and to ensure that the laws introduced by the government meet the requirements of the manifesto. The, the Customs Bill is very worrying because 
it makes the most enormous power grab for the Crown that it creates the ability to make trade deals by ordering counsel without um, taking into account any other legislation. It can override all legislation by ordering counsel. This is a very extraordinary clause to have in a bill uh, and I don't think um, I don't think I would accept it even if it were in my own interest to accept it because it is so unconstitutional. Do you, do you suspect a trap? I mean, uh, to Davos, um, Philip Hammond praised the CBI and he mentioned them by name several times. Do, do, do you this. mean the EU-funded CBI? It's very important to remember they got a million pounds near I'm enough from... always prepared to uh, allow from, you from, to put those initials the and the hyphen um, before I refer to the CBI. But I wanted to go on to make an even deeper point, as it were, I think, uh, about what the CBI are calling for, that the Chancellor quoted them by name several times in Davos. There's one bit of their recommendation he didn't quote, which was their advocacy of staying in the customs union. I mean, do you think he was dropping a hint there that they're right in his view to want to stay in the customs union and that this provision might be in the bill to allow such a manoeuvre to happen? Well, the gossip in the lobby, and I pass it on as no more than that, is that the CBI and the Chancellor were acting in cahoots and that therefore it was all basically part of the same thing. And what you have to remember about the CBI is it is there to represent the incumbents, the fat cats. It is not there to help the consumer. So of course it's in favour of higher prices. It wants to um, protect industry as it is. It's against competition. Whereas what I want to do is through free markets and open markets to ensure that food, clothing and footwear are cheaper, helping the poorest in society most. And what is saddening really, particularly considering what Mrs May said on the steps of Downing Street when she went in, is that the Chancellor of the Exchequer is in favour of the um, producer interest of the fat cats against consumers and voters. The issue here is that the person ultimately in charge of all this is the Prime Minister. You said, look, don't blame the civil servants. The civil servants, after all, must do as they're told. That's the constitutional position. Do you think she's taking enough advice from senior politicians in the cabinet, be they David Davis or Boris Johnson or whoever, about what she should be doing rather than herself um, being locked away, so to speak, with Ollie Robbins and Haywood and so on? I'm not qualified to answer that. I don't know what is going on privately in Downing Street. Um, one reads different stories in the newspapers and assumes that they're well informed, but I don't have any personal information. But you would urge the Prime Minister to take political advice, presumably, r rather than simply say, your civil servants, tell me what you think could be done easiest with the least inconvenience to the system. I would urge the Prime Minister to stick to her own policy. Um, she's very good at that. The Prime Minister is a lady of great principle and forthrightness. Her policy, Langs House and Manifesto, as I've said, were very clear, very strong and very popular. And that is what I would urge her to do, is to have confidence in her own good judgment. What do you feel should be done when you see Ministers of the Crown um, referring to colleagues as swivel-eyed? Ah, oh, the strabismus question. <laughs> yes. Do you know, I think Claire Perry's wonderful. I'm one of her greatest admirers. She's forthright, she's gutsy, she says what she thinks, and if she thinks I've got a strabismus, I'll forgive her because she's a very capable person and makes a good contribution to public life. Do you think your colleagues are as forgiving if they think <laughs> they might necessarily be afflicted with the same condition, in her view? Um, oh, some will mind and some won't, but I, I don't think the sort of pot shots of rudery in politics should be taken too seriously. You're being very charming and um, good-mannered, and I really feel ashamed to ask you the next question I'm going to ask, which I have to, really, given these reports of the 48 letters and so on, the general sense of instability. Um, you are quoted in the prints now, in the blogs, as much as some cabinet ministers, I dare say maybe more, you're absolutely not going to stand for the leadership if there's a vacancy, are well, you? There isn't a vacancy and the Prime Minister has my full support. All right, that's not a no. I will well, pass over. You, you, you said there isn't a vacancy. You've gone further before and said it, it's absurd to, for a, a, a backbencher to be talked of as a possible Prime Minister in, in government. 
I, I, a friend of mine pointed out to me last week uh, that um, the Conservative Party, when in government, has always had somebody who has been Home Secretary, Foreign Secretary, or Chancellor of the Exchequer since Stanley Baldwin. And I didn't really model myself on Stanley Baldwin. And you are, though, um, just in case this point has been missed in the general babble, you're a great admirer of the Foreign Secretary, are you not? And you think he's got a, a lot to offer. Uh, are you looking forward to his speech on a liberal Brexit that we hear will be delivered soon? I always look forward to Boris's speeches. He, he's an amazingly charismatic figure. Um, he's a leader. And that is so impressive about him. The remarkable thing is that he could win London twice, essentially a Labour city, but that when he goes out campaigning, people literally stop their cars to get out and shake him by the hand. I'm not sure there are many politicians in this country of whom that is true. He's a leader, you said. Is he a future leader? Well, I backed him for leadership um, in um, uh, 2016 uh, because I thought he would be a very good leader. Um, there is no vacancy for him or for me or, or for any other of the other people in, in the Conservative Party because we've got uh, a very good leader as it is. And just to summarise, in your view, really, what that leader needs to do next is to see through the policy on the lines that she announced in her conference speech in 2016, in her speech at Florence after that, and see through the logic of leaving the customs union and make a decision that would set us to be nearer uh, what David Davis has described as Canada plus plus plus. It's an obvious thing to do. Oh yes, and it's easy to do because the President of France and Monsieur Barnier have both said that that's what we can have. And I think we should say thank you very much, that's great, let's have it, let's get all done dusted, let's not have an implementation period because we can have it by um, 29th of March 2019, and on we go. The template is already there, the pluses can be added reasonably simply because we are currently very aligned even if we go our separate ways later. The Gordian knot was very easy to unravel because Alexander just took his sword and cut through it. I think people exaggerate the difficulties of this. There is a knot, but there is also a sword to cut through it with, and that sword is basically Canada plus plus plus. Just a final question that's um, aligned. I'm almost sorry to ask it after your perorations. It takes us into a slightly different field, but an interesting one. When we did the first Modcast, um, you indicated that um, there has to be some increase in NHS um, spending given the pressures on the system. I wanted to ask you how you feel about defence. Defence is the other great pressure point on the government. Uh, it's no secret that there's been a to-do between the Chancellor and the Defence Secretary. Um, I, I looked at the figure and found that were we to spend 3%, funnily enough, it would be in the same general ballpark as the... Um, original Boris Johnson £350 million a week figure. There's another substantial tranche of spending. How do you feel about this? What do you think we should be doing about defence? Well, I'd say two things. One is we only have any money to spend if we grow the economy, and we can do that by leaving the customs union the single market. So it ties in with Brexit. There's a huge Brexit dividend because of the freedoms we will have economically outside. And the second thing is that I um, am an admirer of Gavin Williamson. And he pointed out recently some of the risks from Russia. The day before the Russian opposition leader's office was raided and he was arrested. And um, if that doesn't make you nervous about the state of democracy in Russia, I don't know what would. So without being uh, reds under the bed about it, I think there are risks in this world and we need proper defense. Uh, and that we want to revisit defense spending but I don't want us to start spending money on everything. We still have limited funds, and it's a question of choice. But these choices become easier if you make the right economic policy, which we get to the sooner we get free of the single market and the customs union. Your view really is leave the EU, grow the economy, and then at least it would be easier to meet the needs of the health service and defence both of which you want to do. Both of which I want to do, but don't set arbitrary targets as a percentage of GDP. I think um, hypothecated spending and hypothecated taxation are really, really bad ideas. 
and we shouldn't weaken on that because of temporary spending concerns. I'm obviously not in favour of the Nick Bowles turn national insurance into a national insurance health tax. I, I'm so in favour of Nick Bowles as an individual. I think he's one of the most important and interesting thinkers in the Conservative Party. But the problem with hypothecation is that you find you have the wrong amount of money and then you have to make it up from somewhere else or you start raiding it. And actually, I think from what you said, you're not in favour of adopting a 3% target I wouldn't say for defence. No, I think these targets are dangerous as well, because if we grow the economy, we may be able to do it on a lesser percentage. If, on the other hand, the economy shrinks, we may find that we've got to spend more because defence remains such an important priority. I don't think these targets are the right way of determining taxation and expenditure. Dick, thank you very much. It's a fascinating discussion. Who knows what we will find when we sit down with you in a fortnight's time. But for the moment, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The Mogcast. A fortnightly conversation with Jacob Rees-Mogg about the topics of the day.